Hello, I'm Marcus Railton, and this is the Scots Care Podcast. Scots Care is the only charity dedicated to helping disadvantaged Scots in London through a range of support, including mental health therapy, financial grants, advocacy, sheltered housing for older Scots, job coaching, social events, befriending, and support for children and families. The charity has been running for 400 years to help break the cycle of poverty experienced by some Scots in London. In this series of the Scots Care podcast, I'll be chatting to celebrities and supporters of the charity that have forged a life often away from Scotland and about the ups and downs that can bring. Joining me this week on the podcast is businesswoman Christine Essen. Christine is the co-founder of the Scottish Business Network, an organisation that helps Scottish companies develop and grow globally. She's also an ambassador for Women's Enterprise Scotland, breaking down barriers for women in business. Christine is a wonderful example of success, not just in London, but the world over. And it's great to have her on the programme today. Scott's Care. Hi, Christine. Hi, Marcus. Thank you for being on the Scots Care podcast. I know you're really busy. No, it's a, it's a pleasure. Always good to talk to another Scot about life. I know you're based north of the border now, but you do a lot of business south of the border and you did live in London for quite a while, didn't you? That's correct. In fact, uh, I just returned yesterday evening from being down in London. Um, but yes, I'm now living in Glasgow, in my home city of Glasgow. I'm a proud Glaswegian. And yeah, uh, as most Scots do, we, we commute back and forwards, not only to the rest of the world, but down to London. London being London and, and England being Scotland's largest export market. Whereabouts in, whereabouts in Glasgow were you brought up? Born and raised in Bears Den, All right, and okay. uh, absolutely love uh, this part of, of the world, although I was very blessed when we did live in London, we lived north of the city, we were on the Thameslink line, and we were in Hertfordshire, and it was absolutely beautiful there as well, but today I'm looking out uh, that lovely uh, well, Scottish word dreek. I'm looking out in a very dreek Glasgow sky here and having come back from the autumnal colours and the, the warmth of the southeast, I have a little pang to be back down the road at the moment, Marcus. I know there's such a difference. What is it, 450 miles or something? That's such a difference. I was looking at it's It's raining here where I am in Greater London. And I was looking out and I was talking to my kids this morning and they were saying, oh, it's raining, Dad. I said, well, it's not really raining. It's more smurf. And uh, my nine-year-old boy said, what's, he went, what's smear? So I said, smear, it's kind of like really wet rain. You know, it's, it's so Scottish, it's smear. You know, so what brought you to London? What brought me to London is, as so many Scots, it was work. Uh, at the time I made the move, I was working for the Irish government. I was working for a fantastic organisation called Enterprise Ireland, the Irish Trade and Investment Board. And I had taken that role actually after taking a year out. I, I went travelling for a considerable period of time and shows when this job came about. It was 2008 and there was a little advert in Friday on the Glasgow Herald in those days and saw this advert for economic development, which is my specialism. And I applied for that job. So they had an office here in Scotland and I was the Scottish rep, as it were, helping Irish companies export into the UK and Scotland, as we saw that as a good launch pad into the, the rest of the UK. So I took that job and then I was offered uh, to take on the role to head up Enterprise Ireland UK. So the UK has, was, and will likely to be the largest export market for Irish companies. So I headed up that team and a particular specialism within that was helping companies who were relatively new start and Enterprise Ireland invest in 100 new businesses each year, 75 of whom 75% of which their first market, overseas market, is the UK. So I worked specifically with those companies, but it was work. Work brought me down. So when Whereabouts did you move down to? I, I, I've mentioned this to another guest. Where I remember when I moved down, I, was, I moved down, and the strange thing was, 
it was exactly the same as you. I saw an advert in the paper, and it, it, when you mentioned it there, it made me think how we've all changed the way we apply for work now. And I saw it in the Glasgow Herald, and it was uh, they were looking for journalists at ITN, and I was at BBC uh, Scotland at that point on Radio 2, and I thought, I could do that. So I wrote to them, and then they called me up on the telephone, <laughs> and I was skinned at the time, and I, I got the, the bus down to London and uh, then then after that I got the job and I moved relatively quickly but I remember moving to London and being almost shell-shocked because I moved from the west end of Glasgow down to Gray's Inn Road you know the you know just beside King's Cross and stepped off the bus and everything was just going a hundred miles an hour did you feel that culture difference? Um, maybe not as dramatic as you felt it. And as soon as you say King's Cross, you know, that the redevelopment there, I mean, the King's Cross that you would have faced is completely different to the King's Cross that there is now. It, no, it wasn't quite rabbit in the headlights. My, um, my much loved older sister moved down to London in 1987 and has only recently returned uh, to Scotland. But so she she was already down there. So there was a lot of commuting back and forward. Mm. And then through my job with Enterprise Ireland, because I was already working, I, I would work, you know, a couple of days, if not a week, a month in London. I took the flight into London City from Glasgow and then took the line along um, our, our office, their offices is in Shaftesbury Avenue. So I was, you know, coming out at Covent Garden and quite often I could leave from Glasgow and be in quicker than somebody coming from a, another part of London or, or the suburbs there. So for me, it wasn't a culture shock. I had been traveling a lot and having my sister there, um, there was a, a lot that I thought I knew. However, I would always say I'm a city girl. I love, I've grown up in a city, um, fabulous city of Glasgow, but London is on another level. It really it is. is. And yeah, I mean, it's I, huge. And in that way, it's, it's interesting you talk about the, the travel. And my wife was working in Wapping for a while and, and we are in greater London. So you're still on the outskirts of London, but it would take her two hours to get there. She would drive to the train station, get the, the train to Waterloo and then the tube to somewhere else and then another tube and then she would walk. And I always thought when she was doing this job, I could get to Manchester <laughs> by the time it took you to get to Wapping. It is, it is crazily big. But you've moved back now to, to the West End of Glasgow. I'm quite envious of that. I do love the West End of Glasgow. I, I spent a lot of time there when I was growing up. What was it drove you back or, or what was the catalyst? The, the catalyst, um, I think just circumstances happen. I mean, we, we moved back, in fact, a year ago this week, um, you and I are recording this at the end of October, Marcus, but it was a year ago this week. It was a number of things, but primarily we'd always kept our home here in Scotland because we knew we would come back at some point. Mm. And my husband that, you know, part of my story is the fact for 20 odd years, my husband hasn't lived in Scotland. He is a Glaswegian like me, but sadly, as so many of us find career wise, he moved out of the country in order to develop his career. So Alistair has, has lived and worked in um, Ireland, interestingly enough, not at the same time I was working for the Irish government. But he's lived and worked in Ireland, uh, lived and worked in, in South Africa, worked in Germany, worked in, in London. Um, and Alistair retired just, just before COVID. And so... I think just circumstances. I can't say there was one big thing, but yeah. sometimes you just go with the flow. And Alistair and I just sometimes just go with the flow. And that flow has brought us back to Scotland. Scots Care has a dedicated employment service to help people back into work. Our job coaches can help with skills ranging from writing a CV to building confidence in interviews. Job applications can be tough, and we're here to help with this too. Now, what I want to talk to you about now is the Scottish Business Network. Is the, you are the founder of the Scottish, or the co-founder of the Scottish Business Network. What was it inspired you to create this? Was it all the back and forth you were doing and seeing a niche there or seeing an opportunity? Yes, 
to that, seeing a niche, seeing an opportunity. I mean, any business you have to address a, a market gap, a market opportunity. And the market gap and opportunity that myself and my co fantastic co-founder, Russell Dalgleish, um, identified, there's 346,000 businesses in Scotland, yet only 11,000 11, of them export. That's just over 3%. And in fact, 100 businesses account for 60% of Scottish exports. Wow. So there was a gap there in order to help and support companies who have the ambition, the passion and commitment to go global. And what we do is very, very simple, is we make meaningful connections. But the driver behind that was the fact that, as we spoke earlier, I moved to London. I was working for the Irish government uh, with the Scottish husband. I just needed some Welsh link there and I could <laughs> have the, the, the full, full suite. Um, but I would be out morning, noon and night telling the story of great Irish entrepreneurs. And, you know, that that is fantastic because they have a wonderful story to tell. But I started to wonder who's telling the story of great Scottish entrepreneurs? Who's telling the story of Claire Campbell, of Prickly Thistle, the first woman to own a weaving mill in the Highlands of Scotland? Who's telling the story of Karen Somerville, of Angel Share, a fabulous glass blowing business in um, Bridge of Allen that's just won a phenomenal export uh, award to take her into the Far East, of Glencraft, uh, who are mat mattress makers, the royal family, who do again phenomenal work out in the Far East. Who is telling their story to the Scottish diaspora? And you know yourself, Marcus, and maybe people who are listening to this as well, know that when you're down south or even just out with, another good Scottish word, when you're out with Scotland, finding those stories about great and current Scottish entrepreneurial activity is difficult. So I met quite by chance, Russell Dalgleish in a coffee shop uh, one day in Tottenham Court Road. And as we'll possibly go into later, I don't drink tea or coffee. So, you know, I, I was in this coffee shop and I met Russell and I told that story. I made that comment and I have the expertise because I know how well the Irish use their diaspora. I mean, they are the world leading in diaspora engagement and Russell has a great link and a you know great understanding of the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Scotland. And it was bringing those two elements together to address a clear market gap in helping Scottish companies go global. I think when I look at the, the members of the Scottish Business Network, I'm blown away because A, I kind of think, wow, it's, it's just so interesting. There's so many interesting people there and 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 be all doing all these interesting things and did it grow quite quickly i i'm always amazed at how friend i mean english people welsh people irish people are, fr are not uh, are friendly but you know scots i find maybe it's because i'm scottish we're all particularly friendly did it did it exceed your expectations the the grow the growth Oh, absolutely. I thought this would just be a nice wee thing to do in parallel with my job with Enterprise Ireland, you know, a couple of hours a week, maybe. Um, and it just grew like topsy. But I think, yes, Scots are friendly. Yes, we like to get together. But we also don't suffer fools gladly. Uh, and I think with we are all so busy. Uh, not just in business, but in your own personal time, and particularly in London, because if you go to something out with your work hours, there has to be a purpose, because, yes. you know, we spoke there about your wife's two-hour commute. Many, most people have that commute. Most people are thinking, well, this is lovely to go to the theatre, but I don't know about you, Marcus, but I'm always thinking, right, okay, Hopefully they won't go for an encore in that show because if they leave now, I can get up to Kings or St Pancras and I can get the Thames link home. So for me, it had to have a purpose and it had to be very a clear, identifiable purpose that people could get behind. So yes, friendly, great. We love to network. 
but it had to be clear in its message. And the message is, we will tell you practically the stories and the ambition of Scots and Scottish entrepreneurs, and they will very clearly share with you their laser-focused ask, and that is our USP. I don't want someone saying, yeah, here's my business and here's how I'm aiming to grow the business, because I always say, right, what can Scottish Business Network across the world do to help you? And they have to be laser focused. Don't tell me you want to speak to someone in HR and an engineering company in London. No, I want to talk to Christine Essen, who's head of H HR in company X in London. Why? Because I believe our software product meets their needs at the moment because I've seen through their, they're going through a significant change. Be brief, be specific be gone that that's quite, is that's, well that's quite refreshing christine isn't it because if i get that introduction and then i come to you you can say yes or no and then we can all move on and we can you know we can remain friends but at least at least there's no gray area about it you know our, our mantra is or our, our statement is we make meaningful connections so you need to know what it is you're wanting from us what it is you want from our community because we're all busy but what you have as a community, uh, we, we haven't spoken about it, but you know, a lot of this is about trust, that you trust the other members in that community, that we trust the people who have an ask. We had a fantastic session on Tuesday night there at our uh, partnership at Scotland House London, and we were focusing on the creative industries. We heard a fantastic story from Rachel McClelland of Planet Shine. Now, she is very much in focus on taking your sustainability story out to the rest of the world and is looking to grow their film studios in the borders of Scotland. She had an ask of the audience. You know, it's the ask about helping establish that film studio in Scotland. And um, that that's what we're, we're about. But it's meaningful connections and it's value add and trust. And what, what level of business do I have to have to come to you? Do I have to have a fully formed business or could I have an idea and say, look, I need feedback on this. Is this, should I grow this or leave it? So at what level do I have to be at before I come to the Scottish Business Network? We're, you know, we're open to all businesses. However, our focus is on going global and any company who is looking to go global you have to have the finances and you have to have the people resource and a strategy for that. We always talk about think global as you start your business. So yes, come to us at the start. Yes, come to us because you want to find out from our ambassadors. You know, Fiona McFadden is, is out in New Zealand. She's a great insight into taking the food and drink industry into th that market. Um, be it Australia and the Far East, Fraser, Fraser Morrison in Singapore. He has some great expertise about, you know, at least secure 10, 10 clients before you physically come into a market and say you've got an export strategy. So, yes, we could help you at that early stage. Um, but I would say that you you're possibly would get greater value from us if you have a fully functioning business and you have a clear strategy because that commitment to go global needs that commitment within the business. Do you think that that um, Zoom and virtual communication has opened up the Scottish Business Network more globally now with kind of pre-COVID? Zoom was around, but it wasn't a big thing. So, so hey, well, hold on a second. Let me ask you that. But then could you also maybe before that, could you could you talk to him about what COVID did to the Scottish Business Network and how you bounced back from that? So I still remember the last event we had, in-person event in February 2020, with 150 people in the room, Scots, Scots wanting to hear about you know, other Scottish businesses going global, with 150 in the room. But Russell and I were still wrestling with this question, well, we've got members across the world, we have ambassadors across the world who are there to help us, how do we connect them in to what's happening in the room? And then lo and behold, the world stopped. 
But the world stopped in a way that allowed us all to go on the same platform. I mean, I'm of an age that the only Zooms that I knew were an ice lolly in the 70s and a song <laughs> by the Fat Larry's band, you know? So Zoom for me was a whole other world. They're both quality products, though, aren't they? Both quality products, <laughs> absolutely. But what, um, we, as all businesses had to do, you had to react. You had to be flight of foot. And it occurred to me, hang on a minute, we have Scots all around the world who are experiencing this in different waves. So what we did was start to bring our community together online using Zoom and we brought them together and started the first event that we had and we entitled them View From My Window and we had a Scot living out in Beijing of course, in Beijing at this point, they had opened up again. Come, okay. I think that was April we ran. That might have been the end of March. It was no later than April. They had opened up again. So Tom told us a story about, A, what the view from his window was, was, OK, it was late night in Beijing, but there were still cars out and about. There was nothing happening in the UK. As he walked into work, people were handing out leaflets saying, come to our restaurant, come to our gym. Now, September, we'd eat out to help out. So he was able to share what was happening there. OK, China has gone through another phase because of its zero tolerance. But he was able to show what was happening to then we worked our way across the globe, ending up with Anne in Los Angeles. By the time we got to Anne, they were in tight lockdown and there was robots going around the streets of Palo Alto delivering food. Um, so it, we were able to say, well, we can still connect you as, as a member and as a trusted uh, network with what's happening elsewhere. And the key message there was don't go into your rabbit hole. Don't bury your head. Keep that connection going. The world operates. People do business with people and the world operates on connections. So Zoom gave our community the opportunity to keep those connections going, find out what was happening in the world. But it also gave us a platform that we are still using. So Tuesday night, it was a platform, a hybrid event. We had a group of folk at Scotland House London down at Blackfriars on the Thames, and we had people joining us from all over the, the globe. So it, it's working for us. It gave us a, an answer to a problem we were already facing. You, you mentioned earlier, you're talking about Scottish Business Network ambassadors. Now, you're an ambassador for the Women's Enterprise Scotland. Could you tell me how that works and what that is? Sure. Women's Enterprise Scotland, something I'm incredibly proud to be an ambassador for, um, came out of the fact that women-owned businesses in Scotland account for 20% of the business base, um, and we contribute $8.8 billion to the Scottish economy. Now, Already the Rose Report, which came out in, in 2019, Alison Rose, head of um, Nat West, if women started businesses and scaled at the same rate as men, that would bring another 250 billion to the economy. Now, we are heading into extremely challenging times. And what Women's Enterprise Scotland is doing is looking to break down those barriers for women in, in coming into business. So we support women-owned businesses. We seek to provide equal access to resource and opportunities as women grow and build their businesses. And a lot of that now we've fortunate, a fantastic piece of research, not from Women's Enterprise Scotland, but um, a lady called Jill Page started this called the Gender Index review where all 435,000 active businesses in the UK have been analysed. Uh, go on and look at it, gender index report, and it gives you data on how many of those businesses are women owned, how many of them are, are women in the management team, how much funding they've got. Less than 1% of venture capital funding goes into a women-led business in the UK. That's a shocking statistic. In fact, I think that's even the global statistic. But those are figures that um, Women's Enterprise Scotland are seeking to address 
through policy, through data, and through ambassadors that we seek to be role models uh, for other women going into business. Did you know Scots Care provides homes for older Scots across London? If you or yours are finding it hard to find a home, we've close on a hundred high quality sheltered housing flats to help make a fresh start. My wife was very impressed by it because when um, we were talking over email prior to this interview or this chat, this blether, um, I was. To, I then spoke to my wife about the Women, Women's Enterprise Scotland, and she works in advertising, which is a, a very male-dominated industry. And and my wife was talking about being perimenopausal, and she's struggled to find help emotionally and physically. You know, her confidence has been knocked. She questions her decisions. She gets brain fog and. And I'll be honest with you, she said to me, because I said, do you mind if I talk about this to Christine? Um, and she said, no, that's fine. You talk about it because I think we all have to talk about it. And my wife's a successful ex executive at a well-known London-based global advertising firm. And I just wonder if we are ignoring 50% of our workforce because, you know, there is the biggest demogra growing demographic is menopausal women, 40, 45 to 55 year old women. Are we not, do, is business and is policy not doing enough to look after women? Totally. And what your, your wife's issue is, you know, this is something that will affect, God willing, every woman. Um, and the fact is, this is not a woman's problem. And that's what people need to wake up and realise. This is a societal-wide problem. We all have to address it because if you're suffering from that brain fog, if you have had a horrendous night's sleep because of the hot flushes, if you're sitting in a meeting and you have that hot flush, that is horrendous for you. But if we are talking about it because this is a societal wide problem, as is the issue of ensuring women get equal access to business support, that's not a woman's problem. That's not down to women to fix it or to raise the issue. It is a societal wide issue. And the more that we talk about, the more open that we are about it, then the better it is. Because you can only, by talking about these things, understand what is happening to a woman as she goes through this in her life. And by talking about these things, also breaking down the embarrassment about it. And I'm sure that actually, even though you and your wife will have been together all these years, it possibly took a lot of guts for your wife to say that to you and, and to talk about it. It's not something that's easily spoken about. You know, you can see people sort of, oh, crumbs, particularly, um, you know, males head down and off we go. But this is something we need, we need to address. We are disabling a significant amount of our workforce, yes, because of the economic conditions, because but also because of, of society you not know, opening up and, and being aware. These are the challenges we're all facing. Yeah, there was. A, I read a statistic from the Office of National Statistics the other day. It said ten percent of women are leaving their job because of what they are going through, and I, I suspect some of that is because emotionally and physically they can't handle what's going on but they're not getting supported and another part of it will be like you talked about like the embarrassment of going into work and colleagues not understanding or acknowledging what they're going through yeah i mean that you, you start to think you're going mad and, and you know that whole brain fog thing forgetting things and so often as was identified during you know covid crisis the fact is that that women and, and i often when i'm asking people you know what is it what is it you do what is it i i don't often say what's your job i don't like that question i often say what what is it that keeps you busy and people will always start if they have a, a job and for me anybody who i worked with in the workplace who was also uh, a, a wife a mother a carer you know, the, the, you're balancing all that as well. Meanwhile, <laughs> because of who you are, you, you're going through this menopausal situation and the impact that that has on you. And you, you talked about it there, your feeling of self-worth. And, and for many women, it's such a, 
you know, you've moved on in life, you're no longer of childbearing years, that has quite a significant mental impact on, on people. As I say, we need to talk about it. So thank you for raising that question with me. Do you know what I'd, I'd like to talk about? I, I wonder because you're you're a, you're in a senior role and the Scottish Business Network is more than a job to you. It's It really feels like a vocation and it's a passion the way you speak about it. Yeah. Can you create a work-life balance? Have you got that? Good question. Um, if Mr. Essen was sitting here, the answer to that would be no. <laughs> um, I just get an awful lot of fun from it. You know, it is fun. It is flipping hard work. Absolutely. Really, really, really hard work. But I meet such interesting people and the opportunities that Scottish Business Network has given our members, um, the growth opportunities that our members have benefited from is phenomenal. And when you see that and when you see the connections that are made and, you know, a, a lovely story is about Jamie Harris of Essence of Harris. Um, if anybody wants that moment out of your day, um, have a look at Jamie Harris, uh, Jamie McGowan's feed and he talks about living life in Harris while he travels around the world but he worked alongside one of our other members Karen Somerville of Angel Share I mentioned earlier and if you go into their store in Princess Square in Glasgow you will see the most beautiful glass um, dispensers up on the wall in order you can bring in your essence of Harris product, your soap, and get it refilled. Now that came about because of trust, because we're both in our network. And Karen would say, if anybody else had come to me and asked me to make this glass product, I would have said, no, I don't have time. But because it was Jamie and because it was SBN, she went with it. Um, and that's what makes this job exciting. So for me, a lot of my job was talking to people doing this. So it doesn't feel like work, but work-life balance could get better. And I'm always working to do that. Yeah, well, I, I feel the same. I, I think, I, you know, we live in an always-on society with phones and my wife do, and I do try and say, do you know what? We're going to sit down, try and find something interesting on Netflix, but the phones are not in the room because otherwise it just creeps in and all of a sudden you, you're there you're on your phone now this isn't this is the you know this is my big question how did you end up in an ian rankin novel i have read everything that man has ever read and i know who detective constable christine essen is <laughs> you know and then then i started talking to you and i thought it was just a coincidence and i think i read it in a newspaper article but that is actually you how did that come about it is me Yes, um, the gift that keeps on giving. Um, uh, and uh, last week he started talking about me to Janice Forsyth on BBC Radio Scotland oh, and my lovely. brother-in-law nearly smashed his car because, you know, <laughs> you're flipping it and he started talking about Christine Essen, who is a real person, you know. Um, how did that come about? That came about because a very, very dear friend of mine, Lorna Huyenga, took a table at a charity night many years ago in Glasgow and the charity was Nordoff Robbins, a fantastic charity, yes. music therapy charity. And, you know, you all turn up and on the table is that thing of things you can bid for. And one of them was be a character in a, the next Ian Rankin novel. There was a bit of drink consumed there, but I started bidding and bidding and bidding till eventually Ian Rankin stood up because he was in the room. And he said, look, I can tell there's two people in this room who really want this. So tell you what, I'll put you both in. Oh, fantastic. So th that's that's how it came about. But, um, I mean, I we could do a whole podcast on the impact of that and the number of people that sidle up to me, literally from across the world, who will walk up to me and say, you ever uh, that Scottish author, Ian Rank. And I always know it always starts with that question. And there's always a kind of sidling up. And I go, yes, because I know what's coming next. And they go, um, have you read um, <laughs> the book? There, you know, there's somebody. And my point always is, how many Christines do you know? Oh, not many. Not many. OK. Other than myself and my husband, how many Essens do you know? Oh, nobody. Such an unusual surname. And I went, it is me. Because it's me even more so because... It, as I mentioned earlier, I don't drink tea or coffee, 
And the key thing about detective calls yeah. for Christine Essen is she drinks hot water. And that was an email correspondence between Ian and myself um, because he asked you before you go in the book, would you like to be a goodie or a baddie? And because of what I've just described, I have a very unusual name that I said, I better be a goodie. But please, whatever you do, Ian, don't have me as, as girl in the coffee shop because, you see, I don't drink tea or coffee. I'm actually, uh, you see the looks I get in coffee shops. I'm a very cheap date. That was what I said to him. And that was taken almost verbatim and put into standing in another man's grave. The book that I first appeared in, which was fantastic because that was a return of the fantastic Rebus character who had who'd retired earlier, but because Ian Rankin writes them in real time, there had been a change in Police Scotland that allowed those who were of a certain age to come back into the police force. So I knew I was going to be a character, but I didn't know what book. And of course, when it was discovered that it was Rebus coming back, I was like, Yes, not just a character, a recurring character. Returning character. But I'm glad you've noticed. I have family members who've read books and I say, oh, really? That's me. I have a cousin who it had to be pointed out to him that that Christy Nason was. A... I never really thought about that. Yeah. So there's, I honestly, we could do a podcast of what happens when you become a character in a book novel. That's brilliant. Maybe we shall. Christine, thank you for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Best of luck Bye. for the future. I'll speak to you soon. Thank you, Marcus. It's been a pleasure. Scots Care. For Scots in London in need of support, financial, practical or emotional help, 